Hi, welcome to Off Script. I'm Zach Lewis. And I'm Dr. Draper. Today on the show, we're talking about crimes of the future. The new David Cronenberg film is out. Man hasn't done body horror in 20 years. The King is back, baby. And we're going to talk about the movie and what we thought. We're also going to talk about the Bob's Burgers movie after 12 seasons of adult animated you know, uh, antics on television. The Bob's Burgers uh, family has officially transitioned to the movies. We saw the film and we're going to talk about what we thought. We're going to talk about Netflix's new strategy about making movies going forward. You might be surprised. Uh, there's some recent investigating from The Hollywood Reporter regarding their, their, their recent slump. And I want to talk about what's going on there. And lastly, well, actually, firstly, we need to get to the news. Our first story this week, uh, Morbius came back to movie theaters and it did terrible. <laughs> <laughs> maybe more, the funniest possible oh more god bucks. yeah maybe the funniest possible thing that could happen after weeks of online memes and goofy tiktoks and antics from people saying it's morbid time on twitter uh sony took the bait and put morbius out in a thousand theaters 1000 movie theaters ran morbius again last weekend and it made eighty five thousand dollars on friday <laughs> <laughs> across across a thousand theaters uh not outstanding that that's actually going to be a big miss it likely cost more to put it in theaters than it did to th they made money back uh what what a what a mess andy what do you know about this um the, the internet remains undefeated uh mm. morbius was you know perfect meme fodder uh, because it's such a kind of a bad terrible superhero movie and jared leto is just you know the kind of the worst actor working right now. Uh, and so I don't know what executive thought that this was all like positive buzz and that they should re-release. I mean, the movie did, didn't do very well. Um, you know, it, it maybe broke even at best in during its original run, but there's no hunger or, you know, for it. I guess maybe they thought there was some sort of cult following, but that definitely wasn't the case. I mean, it was, it was, it was, it wasn't quite, like trending on on film twitter at least in my experience but like a lot of people were joking about morbius for like weeks and and there was that whole thing uh it ran on twitch at one point people were live streaming pirated copies of the film uh amazon had to t turn people off like the, the whole it's morbid time meme started moving around like it got it got pretty aggressive and i'm gonna be honest i, I was a little concerned like i i I trust American audiences to go do the right thing at the movies, but these are also the people that go see like the fast and furious movies and Michael Bay films. Like when they run with the meme, it seems like they're really into it. It was a pleasant surprise to wake up over the weekend and see, Oh no, it totally flopped. They didn't even make a million. Like the movie made 73 million, 73.2 million in theaters. It's original run. And now it's like 73.8 million. Like they didn't even jump a number. Oh my gosh. I love it. Yeah. Like, it's a disaster. And like I said, it, it's baffling that anyone would see this and be like, yeah, we should totally re-release it. Yeah. I, 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 I don't know what the next move is for Sony. Obviously they're going to make another Venom movie. They're going to keep trying to build this universe on the back of Spider-Man. Um, but I, I just, I mean, the problem, I don't know. What, what do you think the odds are they making Morbius too? Jared Leto uh, hopped I on Twitter and Instagram no. and posted a goofy video about making it, which I hate. I hate the idea that he, he's acting like he's in on the joke because he's not. He is the joke. He, he is, is the, the entire joke, yeah. circus. They're not laughing with you. They're laughing at you. No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're all making we're all laughing at his expense no the, they, like, the, there's no way they make another one of these right they'll do what what marvel has been better about with some of their smaller characters they introduce them as part of a larger movie yeah you know like when when they brought back uh uh the, when they added the incredible hulk they didn't yes he had his own movie but it wasn't really part of like the mcu um uh -huh. and some of the other characters like Black Widow is a perfect example. They introduced her in during the Iron Man films, and then she kind of became more than that, and eventually got her own film later, much later. Um, so yeah, something like that's probably a better strategy. I agree. Uh, also, a bit of off news. We're going to the next story. Uh, Black Widow. Speaking of, won Best Hero at the MTV Movie Awards. So look at that. That's kind of neat. Yeah. Uh, our next story. Nev Campbell's not coming back for Scream Six. Uh, this was kind of a surprise this week uh, after the success of Scream 5. It seemed a whole lot like Nev Campbell was on board to be the legacy star in future Scream films like Jamie Lee Curtis and the Halloween reboots. 
Uh, but that doesn't seem to be the case anymore. Following some uh, discussion about salary and how much she was going to get paid, Nev Campbell feels she would be underpaid for Scream 6 and has opted not to appear in the film. Andy, what do you... Uh, it's a, pay, pay, a classic pay dispute. Happens all the time in Hollywood. This is usually used to just drum up some more support for the star. Yeah. She's, she, she's going to be in Scream 6. They're going to figure this out. They'll come back to, you know, they'll give her whatever she wants. Um, wow. At, at at the same time, th this shows the danger of relying so much on legacy characters and not kind of establishing a new franchise or handing the franchise off to a younger cast, which is what they're, they're trying to do uh, very much so, is that you, you got to deal with these legacy characters who kind of, you know, have the upper hand. They have all the leverage here. Like, you can't not have Sidney Prescott in the movie. Um, yeah. So they're going to they're gonna figure it out. But they could avoid these by a handing it off better and be killing off these characters. Mm. <laughs> and then you don't got it. Like I guarantee you now they'll pay her a boatload of money to be in scream six, kill her off and then never have to deal with her again. Yeah. I, I want to, I, I do want to talk about who else is coming back for this movie, but I want to mention her statement really quick. She said, uh, as a woman, I've had to work extremely hard in my career to establish my value, especially when it comes to scream. Uh, I felt the offer that was presented to me did not equate to the value I have brought to the franchise. A scream so far has made a little over $744 million at the box office. It is no small feat. And yeah, I don't know what they offered her, uh, but Andy makes a good point. Like, they don't really need her. <laughs> like, it'd be nice if they had her, but like they don't have to have Nev Campbell and Scream Six for it to work. Yeah, uh, it, Hayden Panettiere is coming. Yeah, it's not like it's not like Laurie Strode, and no, even then, like you, yeah, and even then you have to bring in other characters. You can't she, just no, rely on her forever. She was almost tacked on in Scream Five. Like even then, you didn't really need her. Uh, yeah, it's it's worth mentioning Hayden Panettiere is coming back from Scream Four, so they're at least grabbing her out of the ether, and then they're going to bring Jenna Ortega, Melissa Barrera, and a couple other characters back. I think Jenna Ortega is getting a bigger role in Scream Six, don't you? Yeah, she had probably a decent role in Scream Five as kind of a sister who's dispatched early and just appears in hospital scenes throughout most of the movie. But uh, yeah. You need, and that's the thing that there. It's it's a tough thing because you can't use too big of a star. Like you can't get Tom Holland in Scream Six, but you you're trying to make stars out of the new cast, and it's, it's a bit of a challenge. Yeah, and and that's not going to be easy to do. But I think you're going to be off better off by you know maybe leaving some legacy characters behind. Clearly not all. They've got Hayden Panettiere back. What else does she have going on? But for what it's worth, like good for get good for Neff Campbell. Good good for not being good for her for not being defined by like this one series. It would be so easy to just show up and collect a paycheck every time they roll up one of these movies, right? Like uh, Michael Gross in the Terminator, Terminator uh, the, the Tremors movies, except he actually does get action and like run around and stuff. But anyway, uh, you know, good for her. She knows what she's worth. All right, I, I respect that, and uh, I think Scream Six might uh, might be in a good place regardless of whether or not she's in it. Our last story uh, from the box office this week, Top Gun 2 is continuing to be the biggest movie ever. <laughs> Andy, what do, you, what do you know about this? Huge, huge second weekend. We knew it was going to be huge and nothing came out uh, against it. Uh, Save Crimes of the Future, which is specialty box office. So that doesn't really count, uh, but came out for a record $90 million in its second weekend, uh, crossed $550 million globally. And it, and it set a record for, it, this is like a baseball stat. It's very specific. And it's like the second weekend of a holiday for a movie starring Tom, like huge weekend, <laughs> $90 million, $550 million globally. It's massive. And it, it's Tom Cruise's biggest uh, money-making uh, more than uh, one of the Mission Impossibles. I think the last one, uh, Fallout, was really big. At, and also, surprisingly, the Steven Spielberg War of the Worlds uh, movie from the mid-2000s was actually one of his biggest movies as well. And this has uh, kind of blown both of those out of the water. War of the Worlds was such an odd film. Do you remember watching that movie? I actually haven't never seen it. Have you really not? Steven Spielberg. You're like, yeah. uh, oh, man. So, we should, somehow we should I missed do War of the Worlds. Okay. Put, put that on the watch list. At some point, we should do War of the Worlds. Uh, I'm, a, I, 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 I'm a little surprised. I think people who have seen Top Gun Maverick and, and have heard this fervor for a couple weeks now may not be surprised that it's doing well. But like before this happened, Andy and I talked about on the show, Top Gun 2 may not be this big pop. I mean, it was scheduled to make something like 90 to 110 million. Mm -hmm. And we yeah. even thought it might be. We were not skeptical of that. Yeah. yeah. Like, so, so it, it's easy to look in the rear view and say, oh, of course, of course, it's Tom Cruise's biggest movie ever. Of course, it's doing great. But like, it, it genuinely was a little shaky. 
Sneaky coming it, up to this. It, well, it did the one thing that no movie has done in literally the last two years, which is get older audiences back into the theater. Like the the forty and up crowd has just not come out for anything, and there's been movies aimed at that demographic, and they're just no, I'll just wait for scr- for streaming. But I think a combination of Tom Cruise's star power, the legacy uh, of the property, the IP something that's not superhero related that you would have had to see 20 movies of and just bringing a different kind of action you know the the fighter you know the fighter jet sequences are are really ast- astonishing and it's something very different that we haven't seen in the theater for a really long time yeah and I, i'm curious to see if we will see other films be developed around that blueprint right there like older legacy title that's going to pull the 40 and up crowd with like one or two really solid stars at the front that elicits a bit of nostalgia that you can kind of refresh and make new i know like the the age of the reboot is upon us right the age of the remake sequel um but in the case of top gun like there's few who do it better uh and it helps that it's a genuinely good movie like it's a great script it's a lot of fun the action is bar i mean second to none like it's great it's it's a very well-made feature and well like everybody worked on top guns excited to see these numbers and not only that it has really high rewatchability it like it's gonna have legs it's gonna be in the plane in theaters for a while probably t- to mid-july like it's a it's the kind of movie you can go back to in the theater and it's worth it and like you'll enjoy it just as much every time yeah couple other bits of news from this uh, before we jump into crimes of the future. I just wanted to get to some of these other smaller numbers. Doctor Strange and Multiverse of Madness just crossed $900 million globally. Not nothing. I know that movie's already in the rear view and we're already looking forward to some and other stuff, but like Doctor Strange 2 made almost a billion dollars. Remember that when they make Doctor Strange 3 and maybe Doctor Strange 4. <laughs> also, also, you know, we, we, we've, God. we've said uh, Doctor Strange w- was kind of, it wasn't mediocre, but it was just kind of okay. Um, you know, it, it it's not like Top Gun sure. and it's still making like it just shows the power of Marvel and the MCU that you can come out with kind of an OK movie and still make almost a billion dollars. Yep. Additionally, uh, Crimes of the Future, which we we're going to be talking about shortly, open to uh, a little over one million dollars. Uh, and it was a wide release for Neon, who published it. They put it out in 773 theaters. You know, it's a smaller feature. Like Andy said, it's a very niche audience. That doesn't surprise me too much. And uh, one more bit of news. A- A24's Everything Everywhere All at Once enters its 11th weekend and hits $60 million. Still A24's highest grossing film to date. Woohoo! Love it. Um, with that, we should probably jump into the movie. Andy, any other thoughts before we, uh, you know, get into get into this madness? I'm ready. <laughs> uh i was gonna say andy would you recommend uh anyway get go ahead man you 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 got it on this one crimes of the future so this is the latest uh sci-fi dystopian film from longtime auteur david cronenberg who of course is famous for the fly crash videodrome uh more recently things like eastern promises uh history of violence and I can't remember what his most uh, recent uh, C- Cosmopolis, which was a kind of weird film with uh, Robert, Robert Pattinson. Pattinson. Yeah, where it, have it, you seen it, that? I have. It, it it's largely like ninety percent of the movie takes place in the limousine. It's on it, Netflix. Is it worth my time? No, know? it's really bizarre. Okay. It's <laughs> you'll, right. anyway, you'll, sorry. Be, you'll be mad. But anyways, Crimes of the Future. <laughs> um, stars. Well, the story is it takes place in a future where humans have evolved in very strange ways. Uh, There is no pain anymore. People cannot feel pain. And so they they kind of indulge in in different kind of grotesqueries because they can cut themselves and not not be hurt. Uh, Viggo Mortensen plays an artist called Saul Tenser who um, grows extra organs. That's kind of his evolutionary thing and they're essentially tumors but uh they grow and they grow very fast and his uh lover companion artistic partner uh caprice played by leia sidhu she is a surgeon who removes these and they do this very publicly uh with a special equipment and it's this kind of grotesque uh, performance art uh you know he grow he grows the organs she removes them they do this in front of people and it's you know it's saying a lot a lot of uh, kind of weird things. That's their their situation. At one point, we we meet uh, the Department of uh, Organ Registry, where we we meet uh, a registrar and a woman named Timlin, played by oh I can't remember her name now. 
Kristen Stewart. Stewart. Yeah, yeah. Kristen Stewart, who is kind of obsessed with with Saul. And uh, the story is is kind of that's the setup. <laughs> uh, the, the story from there is kind of difficult to explain because it's it's more about like, what does this mean for humanity? Like, are we still human if we're changing so much, if we're evolving? Uh, at one point, there is uh, this registry is part of a larger like government organization to keep this radical evolution in check and kind of see who's evolving who's not in what ways uh you know they can't they can be allowed to evolve in some ways but not in others it's pretty strange to set up lots of body horror um so that's our, our set but i want to talk too much more about it zach what'd you think so it's been 20 years since david cronenberg has made like a quality body, body horror film which is perfect timing because this script is actually 20 years old uh david cronenberg penned it in 2002 uh, under the working title of painkillers and originally had nicholas cage attached to star which would have been a very different movie uh it might might just have been a bop but it would have been 2002 so yeah who, who knows uh somebody somewhere recently as uh, some producer or somebody uh, approached cronenberg i don't know his manager uh, somebody in his life and said hey i think you should do a movie and he said no no no, i just want to do a book uh movies are tough to finance it's harder now than it is before he said no 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 you, sh you should do something really cool there's this old script you wrote painkillers that feels really applicable and he thought well hold on it's a 20 year old thing there's no way this movie about future technology and 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 this horrifying ideal of people not being able to experience pain uh there's no way that still feels relevant now and and they were like no it does crimes of the future has a lot to say about uh, you know the world we live in artificiality uh, um, uh, pain and subsequently pleasure uh art and and high art and low art and what that means to people uh and i think it does a pretty good job of saying those things it's got some very fantastic visuals and some really cool concepts but it does fall a little a little flat in cronenberg's videography i guess in his in his filmography that's what i'm looking for uh but i'm so excited to talk about it because I, I think i liked it more than andy did <laughs> yeah <laughs> i, I kind of liked it a lot uh but i don't know yeah let's let's jump into it so i thought it had some really interesting ideas this idea of advanced human evolution and what what does it mean to be human and when are you no longer human when you're you know when you change so much um you know so that's an interesting concept. Just this world is really bizarre because it's, you know, it's futuristic, but it's also there's no computers and there's no digital anything. Everything is still like done with pen and paper. Um, it, so it, it, it's a kind of retro futurism. You know, if you've played things like Fallout or Bioshock, it's like, you know, it takes place in the 50s, but it, but there's super advanced uh, technology. So that was kind of the, the setting I was reminded of. But just kind of where the story goes and the narrative, it just didn't um, it, it just didn't really grab me and it didn't really make a whole lot of sense. There, there's several different kind of plot lines going on. There's Saul Tensor and their performance art and his relationship with both uh, Caprice and Timlin. And, you know, there's lots of like sexual tension and like sex is a big theme, as well as this whole like kind of cop uh procedural background about like we got to find these people that are evolving um and it just doesn't all tie together cohesively for me but i did think there's you know i, I would rather see someone swing for the fences and miss than not attempt uh regarding the setting i 100 percent agree like it, it it's very much almost like blade runner blade runner 2049 this lean on like <laughs> A world that is visually in disarray, wallpaper peeling on the walls, everything's covered in grime and sand and dust and mold, and and our characters are using technology that's very practical, right? Just little little cobbled together props, you know, a ring that's a camera that somebody will wear and walk around and film stuff, or you know, a big big goofy photography lenses. It 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 is it looks halfway the step between like today and like the world of Pixar's Wally -E. like just everything's going to hell, and 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 this lean on on artifice like like in technology to kind of grow and keep the world going and keep the economy functioning like has uh, people evolving into you know kind of not, not quite cybernetic organisms but like developing themselves into something more and that's that's part of 
this this idea behind what this movie is trying to say if our technology is like vastly accelerating past us like wouldn't humanity have to evolve to keep up would we want an extra set of fingers so we could type faster would we want like addition would, would we want to turn off our pain receptors so we don't feel like pain when it comes along and and our our performance artists have this like wonderfully kind of disgusting view of the world because Saul yeah has has this medical condition where he develops these tumors uh and and like tumor like organs and they are tracking these things and reporting them to the National Organ Registry uh where Kristen Stewart and friends work uh they get kind of pulled into this idea that um he's not like <laughs> Saul Tensor's not like weird. He's he's not part of the freak show. Rather, he is the next step. Maybe, maybe he's he his body is evolving faster than everybody else's, and so it's important to keep up with the stuff. And the characters in the movie totally run with this idea. The people who come see their performance art, who fund their wild antics, like they a hundred percent lean into the idea that this is like the future. That they're yeah. seeing something new and visceral, and and and. It makes for really great visuals, really wonderful scenes of, of surgery using using combination of, of practical effects and a little bit of CGI. Uh, <laughs> really horrifying body horror, which nobody does better, as far as I know, yeah. than Dave Cronenberg. Go ahead, Andy. Uh, yeah, that was the thing I was a little disappointed about is like the, the the trailer. I had a hard time just getting through the trailer. Like it made me like a little nauseous. And so I expected more of that. And really you've seen all you, all the extreme that you're going to see in, in the trailer. It doesn't really go much farther. And you know, th there's a couple of other grotesque people. I'm saying the word grotesque a lot. Uh, but again, we saw it on, on the trailer and it doesn't really amount to more. I really thought the, the movie would be more about, about that kind of like, okay, in this world that where there is no pain, people are altering themselves in all these kind of weird and gross ways. And that's, that's not really the, the, the theme. It's more about the, this human evolution. Uh, but so that like the body heart didn't really serve the story as much as I, I thought it would. And it, it, it also just didn't gross me out as much as I like something like Videodrome. I'm still like, will still give me the heebie jeebies still reeling. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, this, this movie definitely puts the strong visuals in the trailer. Uh, but that doesn't cover the tone of how those visuals are, are, are introduced to you. The context um you know you you in the trailer you might see a flash of some kind of weird surgery or something but you don't see the camera linger on it for minutes on end and you don't see other characters in the scene like actively engaging with this horrifying material <laughs> and often doing really strange things to it with their bodies like you, you do get a bit of that i i agree probably the strongest visuals are in the trailer but the context is nice and I think it's handled well. There's a couple scenes that are like really, really spine chilling for me. There's, there's one particular thing involving a zipper and like an open <laughs> wound. It's just like, Oh God, even thinking about it, like makes me it's just, just, just not fantastic. And I think a big part of the reason that works is because on a small set with a relatively moderate budget, I think, I don't, I don't actually know how much they shot the film for um, you've got really great acting from actors and actresses who reportedly did not really know where exactly things were headed. <laughs> uh, Viggo Mortensen is really, really odd as Saul Tensor. He's, he's constantly like writhing and turning and shifting. He's constantly and like it, sick. Yeah. Yeah. And he's got this like horrible thing going on with his throat where he can't talk. So he's constantly making like throat sounds and like trying to, I don't want to gross anybody out on here by trying to replicate it, but like trying to speak and he can't swallow food. And you're just like, God, this Saul Tensor character is just twisted up. Leia Sadu's Caprice is, is a welcome reprieve from that. She is mostly normal, uh, but as the film goes on, she begins to kind of develop and descend a bit into the madness. And Kristen Stewart's Timlin is like really, really interesting. She taps into just a hair of like the kind of shy meekness of Bella way back when she did Twilight. But with this like, manic energy she's just she's just like really snippy and really like high-pitched and loud and quick and like she, she kind of whispers a lot and like just 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 really really odd odd character and the three of them kind of hold down most of the script there's other characters that swim in and out of the film but for the most part those are going to be the three you're paying attention to um and reportedly at least in kristen stewart's camp like she didn't 
a little like Mad Max Fury Road, like as they were filming scenes out of out, out of order as they do in the production of those, she was like, I don't know how this all ties together exactly tonally to work, but it does. Like somehow Cronenberg manages to pull in the reins and keep all three of them moving in a really, really synchronized swim. And I think you get a solid feature that narratively uh, works for me. Like I was I was engaged the whole time. There, there's another interesting element is that there's these kind of strange machines that people use. One is this like chair that's supposed to make you eat, make eating uh, better, and it's like constantly shifting and twisting, and it looks like it's made out of like human bones. It's really bones. kind of creepy. And it's then there's physical prop, like just physically, yeah. like kind of wretches and moves. Yeah. Um, and then there's also uh, they salt tensor has this weird bed that does the same thing. It's supposed to like anticipate your pain and then uh, shift and move. Cause he, he does apparently feel pain when he sleeps or he, again, when he tries to eat food. And so there's this whole thing about, you know, manufactured uh, convenience or, or comfort for it to, to amend the, these alien things, which are really part of evolutionary, you know, happenings. And so, I thought that was a, a pretty interesting idea. And that's what I, I think works most about it. It introduces some really uh, interesting ideas just about like the human condition and where it is and where it's going. I think that's kind of what worked the most for me. Yeah. The, the machinery in, in crimes of the future. It, oh, hold on. My dog in here. All right. <laughs> Hi. Sorry, I thought I thought I locked the door. I guess not. Uh, yeah, the machinery in Crimes of the Future is uniquely Cronenberg. Like everything looks sticky <laughs> and kind of damp, uh, and it looks like it's made out of human body parts, uh, including the Sark, uh, this this really cool uh, surgical autopsy machine that our two performance artists use to perform. They do they do surgery live in this thing Viggo mortensen's character saw will get in it and and caprice will kind of control it with this weird like frog almost like almost like a toad looking control device that she holds on her torso and, and presses colorful buttons on to work these big physical prosthetic arms with big old surgical knives on them uh i i i was doing some research for them before the show today uh, apparently they had filmed all of that practical and they just cgi'd out the wires like rather than just having cgi knives oh no <laughs> they did as much practical as they could and CG cgi'd out the seams which i think helps sell it and andy's right like you don't actually see that much like brutal gore but the way these like prop knives just like jam into the torsos and start swirling around is just so <laughs> horrifying like oh god and it's supposed to be it's it's so great visually because i know i know the characters don't feel pain uh and, and that does make it feel like oh well they're not feeling anything so what's it matter but like seeing <laughs> To see these prop knives just like stick themselves in it'll make you squirrel around yeah it's like on the it's like on the blend setting like it's so ugly and and it just feels disgusting to watch um and that's like that's that's the kind of experience i get from a movie like titan right like or titan uh from last year like it's so rare i get to feel this feeling like sitting in a theater and i love that this got at least a mildly wide release so that, you know, more people could experience it like us. My God. Yeah. I, uh, it's, it's really kind of harrowing to me. There is a lot of CGI in that, uh, in like some of these surgery scenes and that didn't work as well for me. I also know it's pretty difficult to replicate like, you know, live surgery on, on someone. Um, but th that's something that I didn't, I wish they had found a way to just be a little bit more practical. Yeah, and it's fortunately like the practical effects, uh, you know, I, I, I'm glad they're there because they feel uniquely Cronenberg. Um, there's some other <laughs> kind of goofy, goofy things in the movie that, that that feel like something I'd see in a movie like his. There's this one shot of these CRT televisions, you know, old cathode ray tube TVs uh, during the first kind of like performance surgery where they say in these big, bold, white letters, body is reality. It's like the greatest... <laughs> <laughs> the greatest weird 80s schlock horror and i'm i'm all about it, it feels uniquely sci-fi it feels like a script that i'd only see from somebody like cronenberg it also does have its problems uh it, it it's a little heavy-handed i think in what it's trying to say and it just kind of has a lot to cover i mean you've got to look at like 
one, the idea of the future and what that might hold, how technology might affect that, and how waste produced from constant artificial use like plastics is handled, uh, the evolution of our species and how we perceive evolution versus, um, I, I don't know, disability. Like, there, there, there's a lot going on here. Uh, uh, what it means to, to self-reflect uh, in, in, in the face of art, uh, pleasure, pain is covered. Um, and and I, I that's a pretty good job, I think, of, of, of presenting all of that to you. But I, I'll be honest, like Andy, by the time we hit credits, I felt I felt like I was just wanting a little bit more, um, especially with and I don't, I don't know if you're in the same boat as me, Andy, like the ending is almost a surprise. I definitely thought I had another 10 minutes. Yeah, same. <laughs> it's credits. So I was like, oh, OK, <laughs> that's that's it. That's the movie. Um, it's quick, quick in, quick out. I, I think I think Cronenberg wanted to, to to dust off the old shoes and see what he could get into here, and then he did. Are you ready for recommendations? I think I'm ready for recommendations. <laughs> um, I didn't say good score. Uh, Howard Shore. Yeah, uh, that's actually something yeah. I've been meaning to look up and, and listen to. I did enjoy the score for sure. Mm -hmm. Quality score, quality visuals. Andy, would you recommend Crimes of the Future? I would say save it for streaming. Um, and if you're interested in something different in, in futuristic sci-fi, if you're a fan of David Cronenberg, if you like some, some body horror, or if you're, uh, you know, interesting or looking for bold cinema, I think it's definitely worth checking out, seeing what you think uh, for yourselves. It has some really interesting I ideas and kind of themes it introduces. The narrative doesn't really, uh, isn't cohesive enough for me. I, I thought I could just kind of have more structure and, and direction. Um, and I also felt like this movie just needed like 10 to 15 million more dollars. Like it seemed like it was really done on the cheap. And I, I was like, you, you could... <laughs> If you could add a little bit more to it, add a little bit more to the world building, and yeah, because you know, it, it seems like really sparse with just the amount of people in it as as well. So I, I like I said, I would say save it for for streaming. Check it out if you're interested. Um, yeah, yeah, it, I I agree. I, I I don't. I think if you're a Cronenberg fan, you should go see it in theaters. But like, if you're just looking for something sci-fi to watch, just wait for it to come to streaming. Don't It'll take your probably. Parents. I got HBO. It seems like HBO Max material, but I don't. I don't, I don't know. It could be on Amazon Prime for all I know. Um, it's yeah, it's good, and I I think it is a strong return for Cronenberg. I I want to see what he does next. I hope he's inspired by this. I hope he wants to run in the next direction. Like I said, it, it seems like he's pretty into writing books. Uh, <laughs> I was reading one of his interviews before the film, uh, before we did we recorded this, and he he's like, I really books are a lot easier than movies like they're a lot lower impact and they cost a lot less and it's a lot less headache um so i hope i hope he makes more um and yeah i i it's it's pretty good i i, I uniquely i i do want to compare it just for a minute to like his son brandon cronenberg's movie possessor possessor i think was made on a similar budget and it just felt a little tighter with a bit more flash like possessor managed to look at its budget and, and accept it. And it feels like this movie was trying to operate in spite of it. And, and, and I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I, I guess I'm curious to see what's next. Uh, with that being said, we should move on to our next segment. Uh, Andy, you want to give the, the introduction on this one? It's time for the death of cinema. Otherwise known as the death of Netflix. <laughs> possibly. Yeah. Just about. Um, so after the kind of the, the disastrous April 29th earnings call where Netflix said they had lost uh, 200,000 subscribers, uh, they announced that they'd be making kind of big cuts, big changes to their uh, content model. And and they're going to be making fewer movies, possibly bigger movies, uh, but they're going to try and up the quality a little bit so that that's a huge amount of changes are, are coming. They, at the same time, they have slashed a oh, Tons of stuff has gone on the chopping block. They've laid off like 2% of their workers as well as, uh, like I said, cut production on a, a ton of films, uh, animation, smaller things, un unfortunately. But they got a plan. So that's what we're going to get into. Zach, what do you know? Uh, so Andy introduced this perfect. Yep, April 19th, uh, they had an earnings call. Netflix reported that they lost subscribers. Uh, since then, they, have, they tumbled in stock. They've been down 44% of its original stock value since that day. Morale, apparently, at the company is also stuck at stock level, said one executive <laughs> to The Hollywood Reporter. Um, it seems like people are distracted, given the changes. And so Netflix has employed 
or is planning to employ, it seems, a host of changes like cracking down on password sharing so people can't share passwords between households or adding an ad supported plan for a little bit of a cheaper price so people can get in at a lower barrier to entry. Uh, but this one's weird and it's uniquely film and Netflix is like it or not a bit of a big deal in the film space right now. So seeing what they're going to do may set an example for others in one way or another. And this idea that Netflix is basically looking to kill the mid budget movie is weird because a few years ago, Netflix was the savior of the mid budget movie uh, movies like always be my maybe like a 30 million dollar rom-com did fine on the service it introduced a little diversity had some fun with some big actors like uh, keanu reeves who appeared in a great guest spot brought some people in now they're not going to do that anymore uh they just want to make more red notice and they want to make more of this $200 million movie, The Gray Man, from the Russo brothers who directed Avengers Endgame, starring Ryan Gosling and Chris Evans. It's, it, it, I, I don't want to say movies by algorithm, but Andy, is that like a poor read? Because that's what it feels like. I think that's definitely part of it. The, the other thing is, it, it's interesting that they say bigger, because at the same time, while they're cutting, they're, they're wanting to make some bigger movies at the same time. And the way they define that is instead of making two ten million dollar movies maybe they make one 20 million dollar movie uh so they're trying to maybe up the quality a, a little bit slow down on, on the just because it was just like you know pump out as much content as you can uh that they've reached the wall with that strategy and they're like okay we really get, need good stuff to to keep people so we still will have mid-budget films but they, it looks like they're really gonna go after these the big stuff like you know like red notice the adam project uh don't look up these really expensive like hollywood uh with big names and and budgets uh, they're going to continue to do that um but also gone are the days of the you know 175 million dollar art house film like uh the irishman uh they're <laughs> probably not going to be doing those those kinds of uh things uh and it's a, that's a shame because that that is a great movie that's actually something i put on quite often despite it being in three and a half hours you know funny real quick before i jump back into it uh somebody on film twitter pointed point this out there better title for the irishman would have just been the original title i heard you paint houses much better yeah <laughs> much better title than the irishman anyway uh yes one insider netflix said the goal would be to make the best version of something instead of cheapening out for the sake of quantity quality over quantity it sounds like netflix is still going to be in the acquisitions game uh, they recently picked up a 50 million dollar film from emily blunt called pain hustlers um but they're going to stop making the mid-budget stuff they're going to go for bigger and a little bit stronger they're going to Apparently slow down on animated films as well. Uh, their That's animated division took a big cut, took a big hit in these layoffs. And yeah, uniquely, they're saying, hey, we're not going to do the big like <laughs> we're going to make we're going to make big movies, but they're not just going to give big movies to one artist uh, regarding the Irishman. They said, yeah, we're not going to attract talent and just give them carte blanche to do whatever they want like we're going to go with something that feels concentrated and we're going to go with something that's strategized like something that feels like a smart move for us based on our metrics and netflix has no shortage of metrics right they they keep track of every single bit of data that comes into them who's watching when they're watching why they're watching how they're watching and like that's 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 all well and good, but I can't help but wonder, you know, the influence this might have over other studios. And I hope it's not much. Like I, Netflix is in a unique position that not many other studios are in right now. They've got to try to get their numbers back up and keep people coming back to their service. People that have already left. I don't know if this. I don't know if this is the way to do that. You know, I. I I'm glad they've got the next two Knives Out movies coming. You know, I'm glad they got the Russo brothers on 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 deck. But I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> they Apparently, did, they're still trying to hit one movie a week, though. What do you think? They still, they definitely got to up the quality because we we see it's not consumers aren't having uh, streaming fatigue, which is what some people are saying because Disney is still having subscriber growth, HBO is still having subscriber growth, so the, and those platforms are providing content that people want to see, and so what that tells us is that Netflix is not doing that. They're I know a whole bunch of like mediocre content that like. You don't care if you watch it or, or not. And some of their bigger things are just taking so long. We've talked about Stranger Things is taking so long to develop and, and come out. And they also don't have a lot of properties like that. Like name another show that Netflix has that is as well known as Stranger Things. Like there's not. 
Right. Like they they've they've spent a lot of time just broadening out over the last few years and trying to make stuff that'll apply to a wide range of marketing demographics. And as they've done that, Netflix has grown to be quite the global company. So I get it. You got a lot of different audiences and a lot of different places you got to entertain. But I think when it comes to making movies, yeah, it's probably a smart strategy to just kind of screw things down a little bit, tighten up budgets and say, hey, we're going to invest in things that are smarter and better. Doesn't always work. Uh, two, two, two films cited in here, three films cited in here. Don't Look Up, the Adam McKay film, which we thought was OK. Uh, Red Notice, which was, I don't know, we didn't oh, see God. it. And the, and the Adam pretty Project, medi- pretty mediocre. OK. Yeah, all, all three of these are like, fine and i would say honestly if you're if you're talking about the strongest films out of those i i'd say something like the irishman's probably better and they're not going to make many of those anymore i mean what what about a movie like Rose? is that getting put on the table let that one academy awards you know i i i don't know then again don't look up gotten nominated for academy Awards. <laughs> I, yeah well see that's that's the interesting thing is a lot of times I, i've said how many netflix movies have you rewatched? none <laughs> <laughs> like most Never. of them, are, they're so forgettable. And I've, you know, I see things like Project Power or Extraction or the the Old Guard that that we watched. It was one and done. It's like not worth going back to. It's the TV movie of the week. The Irishman is probably the only thing that, that I routinely rewatch. Yeah, I, I went back and watched the Ballad of Buster Scruggs. Like that too. That's I think I watched film. that two more times. Okay, yeah, Joel and Ethan Cohen, solid. Not mentioned in here, but you know, worth mentioning. I. I I think Netflix is on the right track with their movies, but I hope that they, if they're going to take the time to step back and look at their strategy, I hope they can look at red notice and realize like that was not exactly a cultural smash. Nobody's wearing a red notice t-shirt out. Like that doesn't, that that barely moved the needle, you know, and you had three huge stars in it. uh, Ryan Reynolds, Dwayne Johnson, and Gal Gadot. Um, I don't know. I I hope they put art first. uh, And I, I, even though it seems like this is an art forward idea, it seems like they're definitely focusing on profits and their business. They should. I just, I hope Netflix makes good movies. I hope it, I want everybody to make good movies, right? We want everybody to make good movies on off screen. Yeah. <laughs> we don't, well, we don't want to watch bad movies and Netflix lately is just putting out, you know, mediocre films. Right. And then it's interesting because things like HBO, HBO is more of, they curate content. They don't, create a ton of original content and most of their original stuff that's really good is is usually their tv yeah and and you know hbo's got a significant advantage in their owner warner brothers warner brothers has studios and sound stages and sets and costumes and assets that they've been building for 50 years like it is it's it, it is not only easier to produce an hbo show it's almost it's not cheaper it's almost cheaper per cheaper per dollar they already got a lot of stuff <laughs> Netflix has to go out and buy that stuff. They have to build it. They got to pay Ryan Ryan Johnson four hundred sixty nine million dollars to make two more Knives Out movies. It'd be a lot easier for Warner Brothers to make those films. So they're positioned in a unique spot, but they're a player in the game. It's important to see what they got going on. I think. Any any, uh, know, any thoughts on this for Boss I, Burgers? I mean, we'll we'll wait and see what what these changes mean and what kind of movies we begin to get. Um, but I think it's going to be a long way before we get. You know, again, things that you want to rewatch and ask yourself how many how many Netflix films have you rewatched? Yeah, not many. And the ones we have rewatched are the kind that are gonna get next from this list. So yeah. Bit of a bummer. Hopefully, you know, ho- hoping for the best. Uh, if, for for Netflix's future, they do have those two knives app movies coming uh when they are made and ready to go. Uh we've also got to look forward to Red Notice 2 and Extraction 2. Um God, there was something else. It was there was a good one I wanted to say, and I can't recall what it was. But you know, it's 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 fine. Uh, uh, Netflix is going to keep doing their thing. And if you want to hear more about the future of movies, keep it here on Offscript for more. And with that, we should jump into our final film of the episode. I'm going to be taking the summary on this, so please excuse any clumsy delivery of mine. The movie is the Bob's Burgers movie. So Bob's Burgers is an adult animated show that has been running for 12 seasons on FX. I think they're renewed for the 13th and 14th. And now they have made the leap to the cinema, which is not a strange thing for adult animated shows to do, but it doesn't happen to all of them. I think a lot of people who haven't watched Bob's Burgers might see this and brush it off because, well, I haven't watched any of the shows, so why would I watch it? And and that's fair. People did that with the Simpsons movie. People did that with the South Park movie. But if... You're one of those people who thinks Bob's Burgers is not that big of a show. 
Um, because you know, there's a lot of anime, adult animated shows out there. You may lump it in with something like Family Guy or American Dad or you know, I don't know, uh, Archer. Uh, not every adult animated show gets a film, and they definitely all don't get 14 seasons. Uh, like it or not, Bob's Burgers is a pretty big show. Like, and if it's not a show you watch, and maybe people in your life don't watch it, it's worth mentioning that it's a big deal, and not all of them get adult animated features like this so with that being said i should say i have seen probably every episode of bob's burgers movie (laughs) of bob's burgers if that's not obvious uh by my by my glowing introduction here uh andy has seen none i'm gonna say you've seen maybe a few episodes yeah i've seen i think the first two seasons and then a handful like since okay okay so so you've got a bit of a base for yeah right yeah good to know uh, all right so 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 in in the bob's burgers movie right what's happening well the belcher family is opening uh, uh for for opening the show opening the restaurant one morning and looking forward to going to uh the bank to get their loan renewed for their business uh when when disaster strikes and a monstrous sinkhole opens up directly in front of the store right over the door nobody can get in and they've only got one week to make their money back and save their restaurant and regarding the sinkhole, there's a bit of a mystery around it. And the kid, the Belcher kids stumble onto it and unwittingly discover that if they can solve this mystery in time, they might just be able to save the restaurant and secure their future for a sunny side up summer. The movie is the Bob's Burgers movie. Andy, what'd you think? So I really enjoyed it. And I'm a fan of Bob's Burgers. I just haven't kept up with uh, the show. I was really worried that... Um, there would be all these in jokes that people wouldn't get because there's a ton of them on on the show, and I was worried that they were there would be a ton of them in the movie, and there would be a lot of things lost on people. But they actually really stay away from that. They stay a lot away from a lot of the show lore, uh, but still really introduce the characters and develop the characters enough. So even if you if you haven't met them before, you're going to be real familiar with them uh, throughout the movie, um, and. And they present conflicts and obstacles that are, again, it, that live within the film. You don't have to have seen, uh, you know, 10 seasons of it to know what's going on. Um, but it's really funny. Like the uh, it does that thing where there's like, you know, a joke a second, like the the <laughs> there's so many yes. jokes thrown at you in so yeah. many ways, visual, auditory other things like lots of, of really good gags uh, we, you'll probably if you watch it several times you'll probably catch new jokes uh every time but uh yeah i thought it I thought it was a lot of fun from a a casual fan of the show i'm in the same boat as as a, a bit of a larger fan of the show i don't own any t-shirts or anything but christine and i have definitely watched i think every episode bob's burgers is a show that can be uh, i think i think quickly identified by three key traits uh one pretty simple animation right you get adult animated you got characters with big bug eyes <laughs> talking to each other uh you may have seen some characters like tina or gene in his burger outfit or sasquatch uh number two uh biting wit in its script uh, its writers lauren bouchard and nora smith have written every episode together and they directed most of the television episodes uh it is a laugh a minute script it, characters are are talking over one another uh, like across gags and one will immediately respond to somebody before somebody else jumps in with something completely different. And it makes the show a lot of fun to rewatch, uh, because you go back and catch jokes. Again, the movie is written by the same writers. It is in the exact same tone of that. And number three, uh, it's boundless optimism. Like Bob's burgers is unique because it is always ending on a positive note. And our characters are trying to lift each other up through weirdness and puberty and odd situations <laughs> and like goofy, goofy gags, like sinkholes in front of the restaurant. Like they are constantly elevating one another. And so many other adult animated shows drag each, drag their characters down, right? Homer chokes Bart or, or, or Stewie makes fun of Peter because he's fat. Like so many other shows will go out of their way to be cynical. And Bob's Burgers is a show that uniquely responds to that with a family that is like so crushingly middle class that they're going to lose the restaurant if they can't get the bank loan renewed, uh, which I think creates a good setting for the Bob's Burgers movie. A lot of adult animated shows leave the town, right? Oh, I, the Simpsons movie puts a dome over Springfield and then half the movie, our characters are outside of Springfield. Uh, South Park, bigger, longer, uncut, takes our characters to Canada with an Academy mm-hmm. Award nominated song uh, and ultimately uh, waging war on the world. The Bob's Burgers movie never actually leaves 
their town. <laughs> In fact, most of the movie takes place around Wonder Wharf, uh, the giant amusement park uh, that's just next to, uh, just adjacent from the restaurant. And I think that gives the show the opportunity to just stay rested on the laurels that have always worked. Um, you're not going to have to explain a lot to your audience. It's a pretty simple family, right? You, you got, you got uh, Tina and Linda and, and Jean and Linda. Who's Linda? Uh, the mom. Linda. You got Bob. Uh, God, I can't even think of all the kids' names. Sorry. I just wanted a whole tear about the Bob's Burgers, the show. Andy, did, take this from me for a second. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're exactly right. The uh, it, it works because it it stays in, in film where where – you're not having to explain a bunch of lore or in jokes or, and there are like a lot of characters from the show, but they don't stick with them too, too long. Or like, you know, the show has a lot of episodes with like the kids at and the, and school and the kids at school. And like, we don't get any of that here because the audience isn't going to be familiar. So it does a really good job of focusing on the characters as we know them in this film. And like, they're all kind of struggling with things. Obviously the parents are, are trying to make sure that the restaurant doesn't close. Uh, Tina is, you know, has her heart set on her, her cr summer crush and she's trying to figure yeah. out how to talk to him. Right. Uh, Lu Jr. Yeah. Lu Luis um, is, you know, it actually has a lot of anxieties really unsure of, of herself. And again, all these conflicts are introduced and resolved within the world of the film and you don't have to have seen uh, a bunch of other stuff. And so that, that makes it really watchable to newcomers. Yeah. Uh, the animation for this movie, like I think most adult animated movies is better than what you see in the show. They added shadows. <laughs> so yeah, it's got <laughs> shading now. Right. And, and, and a bit more layers. And I did, I didn't notice uh, two two really noticeable things about the animation. One, really good watercolor backgrounds. I think the show's always had good backgrounds, but like they really stepped it up with the budget and made the, made the, made the show look made, made the movie look very good, very clean, solid art, lots of good colors and shading. I know that sounds silly, but it's genuinely they've got some scenes in here that I'm like, wow, this this is a really cool little underground layer we're in, or like, wow, the underside of Wonder Wharf looks really kind of menacing. I don't know. And number two, um, surprisingly effective character choreography during dance numbers. If you forgot, uh, the Bob's Burgers movie is technically a musical, although there aren't mm -hmm. many musical numbers. Andy, I think there's like five, three or four, maybe? yeah, it's, four, it's... yeah. Uh, I've been going back and looking at the soundtrack on Spotify and sure enough, like the first two tracks on there are numbers from the movie. And there's like at least 25 minutes between the two of them. And it's only like a hundred minute movie. So it, there's not that many musical numbers, but for what's there, the music's pretty well written. If anything, maybe a little complicated, which is not always a problem with Bob's Burgers music. The show has a lot of music. Uh, our, our, our show writers are also a bit of songwriters that way, but uh, surprisingly good choreography lots of animated characters on screen doing complicated dances that i wouldn't expect from an animated show like specific neck movements versus shoulder movements versus whatever i know it sounds silly just if you go see it keep an eye out you'll have you'll see 25 animated characters on screen all doing different dances it's kind of bananas and that's not easy to do so i don't know good quality animation i guess is what i'm trying to say and pretty good music too yeah, the, the the music is fun. There's again, there's not too much of it. They don't o overdo it, and you know the family they get into kind of these ridiculous situations. Um, but it's it's always it's always fun. Like I, I found myself kind of engaged with it the whole time. I was never just like, oh, when is this gonna be over, uh, or anything like that. Sorry, can you hear me? I can. I'm waiting to <laughs> cut out for a minute. I probably cut out too, but it worked out fine. Uh, yes. Overall, I think the Bob's Burgers movie is a solid tribute to the show. Like it does a great job of taking it tonally in the exact direction it's supposed to go in. It feels very much like Bob's Burgers. And it's not trying to be larger than life. I think it's uniquely humble, but the Belcher family has always been humble. Like they've always lived in a crappy restaurant <laughs> and they've always barely made ends meet. So when you watch the movie and the movie doesn't go to grand places and the movie doesn't put grand expectations on our characters, it feels fitting. Like, of course they'd be running around wonder wharf and trying to, trying to make sure the restaurant stays open tomorrow. You know, of course they'd be getting into wacky annex. Like it, 
it feels exactly like it's supposed to. Nobody feels out of character. Nobody feels out of place. Our cast does a fantastic job of voicing their characters. Everybody feels comfortable in their own skin because they've been there for 12 freaking seasons. Bob's Burgers movie is a rock solid follow up to the show. Now, it doesn't stand on its own apart from the show. That I don't know because I've seen a lot of episodes. Andy might know better, but Andy, you said it was pretty fine, right? You have yeah, I, I, like I said, I, I I really thought that it did stand on the show. Like I said, I've only watched the first two seasons, so I'm already 10 years behind on the show, and I was still able to, um, you know, it, I, it still felt relatable and easy to get into even if you're, you're not familiar with the show. Yeah, and uniquely, before I jump to recommendations, I want to mention one more time, the show's very funny. The movie's very funny. I mean, both are funny, but like I, I genuinely laughed a lot during the movie. I don't know if Andy laughed a lot, but I, I like hard blew past the six laugh test. A strong, a strong comedy. Yeah. Some of the best laughing I've done in theaters uh, this year. Solid. And with that, Andy, would you recommend Bob's Burgers? The movie, uh, the Bob's yeah, Burgers movie. Yeah, I would both to fans of the show and newcomers. Uh, I, I heard a review from from Mark Kermode where he said he had never seen the show. He actually thought it was like a kid's show. Um, and after watching it, he was like, I, I want to go check out this TV show. So it's that kind of film that it will get people into the show if you haven't watched it before. I think you could probably save it for streaming. It's not like a diehard must-see in theaters. It is fun and enjoyable, but there's nothing about it that I, it's like, the theatrical th experience is necessarily better other than like if you'd seen it in like a big group of, of, of like of likewise fans which i did not it was pretty sparse actually actually but yeah overall recommend yeah I i'm in the same boat I, I had a ton of fun watching this movie christine and i went and saw it on a quiet tuesday and there was nobody else in the theater because it was the middle of the day uh and we laughed our heads off and, and we joked about it like and we talked about it after i think if you're able to go see it with friends who have also enjoyed the show you're gonna have your best experience but it's a ton of fun I think I think it's just as good as the show. I, I think the Bob's Burgers movie is rock solid. Uh, would recommend if you're a fan of the show. If you're not and you need something to watch, go for it. I think you probably wait till streaming. But if you have the means, Bob's Burgers is on Hulu. And I would say you should definitely go check it out. If you want to know what the movie's about, go watch the show. And if you've already watched the show, you're going to like the movie. And that's the Bob's Burgers movie. And that's our show. Andy, what are we watching next week? So big weekend where we are in the midst of the summer movie season so oh, yes. we're get ready for jurassic world dominion the sixth and i doubt final <laughs> entry into the jurassic world uh, franchise that's gonna be a huge movie re regardless the other two have made over a billion dollars each it's gonna be massive so we'll be seeing that in theaters and then we're gonna jump to netflix for our second film and watch hustle which is a an Adam Sandler basketball comedy dramedy uh, that actually comes out tomorrow, June 8th on a Wednesday. And uh, so we'll be checking uh, that out, see what that's all about. Heard good things. And uh, you never know with Adam Sandler. Like it could it could be uncut gems or it could be, you know, you don't met no be Halloween. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like you the really, ridiculous seven or whatever that movie was. Yeah. Yeah. You really don't know. And just some other uh, releases that are coming out this week to take note of on streaming. Uh, no Time to Die comes to Amazon Prime on Friday, June 10th. So this is Amazon recently acquired MGM, which owns a uh, part of the James Bond franchise. So this is Amazon Prime flexing that uh, that new acquisition. Uh, so you'll be able to see the latest James Bond film. Also coming to HBO Max is The Card Counter, which was the Oscar Isaac uh, star uh, really great for, film from last year written by uh, Paul Schrader and directed by Paul Schrader as well. Uh, so those are just some new, new, new to streaming releases to keep an eye out for if you haven't seen those. Yeah, both solid watches. You should go if you have HBO and or Amazon Prime, you should go check out both those. They're both solid films. I think you will enjoy them. Uh, man, I'm so not excited about Jurassic World. <laughs> I've I've heard kind of mixed mixed reviews so far. God, I man, I barely cared about the first Jurassic World, and then Fallen Kingdom was like a s snooze fest. And like, I I hope I like this one more. I I need to get out of this like cynical rut I'm in with them because they're obviously making a boatload of money, but like they they're they're genuinely less fun than the Fast and Furious movies. Like, it, yeah, God, it's, like that's, just, that's a that's a great comparison because you know Fast and Furious is a big spectacle mm -hmm. action expensive film and so is Jurassic World, but somehow Fast and Furious <laughs> manages to be more entertaining. Yeah, like I I cannot I I don't know if I have the stomach to watch people hold hands up at dinosaurs for oh, ninety gosh. minutes like yeah. and and that be an effective. It's like the Force. 
It's like the force. Like it's just a convenient <laughs> plot device for somebody to not get eaten by a thing that should absolutely eat. Anyway, uh, hustle looks all right. Yeah. I, honestly, I'm, I'm looking forward to hustle because the reviews are decent. And like, like Andy said, like God, Adam Sandler can go one of two ways, man. That's either good or just thunderingly mm-hmm. mediocre. Um, so we'll see. Yeah. We'll, mm-hmm. we'll see. We're going to hopefully it's some quality drama. Uh, sure. If you enjoyed the show today, you enjoyed this little episode off script we did the biggest thing you to help us out is subscribe just subscribe to the show on your favorite podcast platform and uh you know you get off script delivered to you every single week we're on facebook where we live stream the show every tuesday uh we are on youtube where we upload our live streams instagram twitter all those usual plug places we're there you know the show's around and you can check out our website offscriptfilmreview.com you can write us correspondence and mail it offscriptfilmreview.com and let us know what you thought of the show and uh that's our show. That's episode 179 of off script. God time flies. Andy, we're coming up on, uh, listen, we're only 21 episodes away from big two hundred. That's wow. Oh God. I know we're going to do yeah. something. You, you remember that you, blog we had for 100. We're going to have to really nearly do five years of, of bold cinema. I'm going to order a bounce house. It's going to be great <laughs> <sighs> from all of us at off script, the home of bold cinema. I'm Zach Lewis. And I'm Dr. Draper. Thanks for watching.